good friend Ben Pollock. He's the, been the chair of the economics department for just about ever. Uh, he came from Cambridge to Harvard and saw the light and has been at Yale uh, for, geez, 25 years, I guess, something like that. Um, very long time. And he's the Brainerd chair, and if anyone knows who Bill Brainerd is, that's a, that's a big deal, right, to be the Brainerd chair. That says, that says a lot. And so, you don't normally think of, uh, a lot of people don't normally think of economics as science, but it really is. Uh, and, uh, it, and it, it has a, a, at its core a lot of, uh, actually a lot of, a lot of uh, commonality with this building in chemistry. There was this fellow, J. Willard Gibb, who is very important in something called statistical mechanics, and one of his first students uh, was actually a very famous economist, uh, and his taken ideas that came out of a, a science called thermodynamics and applied them to economics. And Ben is a pioneer in doing this with something called game theory. And so he's going to teach us all how to survive the Hunger Games today, I guess. Ben. So what I want to do today is I want to introduce you to game theory. Some of you know what it is already. Some of you don't. It doesn't matter. Um, and I'm, uh, let me just say what game theory is, and then we'll go straight to an example. So game theory is a way of analyzing strategic situations. And what are strategic situations? Strategic situations are any setting in which the outcomes that you might care about depend on actions of more than one person. So that's such a broad definition, it includes almost anything, so let's not worry about the broad definition. The fun thing about teaching game theory at Yale uh, is that you get to play games, and you get to analyze games. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to play a game, and then we're going to analyze it, and we're going to try and draw some lessons out of that analysis. And uh, I'm not giving you the, uh, the um, uh, watered-down version of this. Actually, this, this is the same talk. Actually, I forgot to change the title. This is the same talk I'm going to give to the prospective Yale students uh, on Monday. All right. So, so uh, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I, uh, those of you who are in my uh, uh, daughter's grade on upwards are all Yale prospective students for the purpose of this talk. All right. So I'm going to play a game. So I need a couple of volunteers to play the game. And I'm going to volunteer people. Uh, can I get the, the yeah, so, so how about the, whoops, <laughs> the gentleman at the back with a striped shirt. Can I get you in the front? And, and the gentleman, the, this, this gentleman too? So I just need two volunteers. Uh, and you guys supply the volunteers. I will supply the props. First, let me get your names. So your name is? Uh, Willis. Willis. And your name is? Andrew. Willis and Andrew. OK. So uh, Willis and Andrew are going to be our duelists today. They're going to fight a duel. And uh, uh, to, for them to fight a duel that you provided the volunteers, I'm going to provide uh, two uh, wet sponges. All right? So what I'm going to do is, uh, um, and usually in this chemical lab, you know, there's complicated chemical experiments with fancy, fancy things that blow up on them. This is not. This is water. Not quite so fancy, but we're going to use it. And I'm going to make these sponges wet. Not very wet, but a little wet. And there we go. And I'm going to make them equally wet, although it's not fair. I need somebody just to tell me, are those roughly the equal weight? I'll just hold your hold two hands out. Yep. About, about the same? Yep, good. OK. So uh, Willis and Andrew, right? Yes. So Willis, here's your sponge, and you stand here. And Andrew, take your sponge and come to the other side of the room. All right. Now, before we start, let me get some rules in this. Very important that we understand the rules, otherwise we'll have no chance analyzing this thing. There are two, two players. Each of them has a sponge. They only have one sponge. You want to hold up your sponge to verify you only have one sponge, OK? OK, so each, we're going to take turns here. They're going to take turns. Uh, and each time it's their turn, they're going to have face a choice. They can either throw their sponge at their opponent or take a step forward. All right? OK? Uh, now, uh, certain crucial rules. If you, if you throw your sponge and you hit your opponents, then the game is over and you've won, and the other guy's lost. All right? But if you throw your sponge and you miss your opponents, the game continues. And the critical, critical point is, you do not get your sponge back. All right? So you have one sponge. Once you've thrown it, it's gone. So let's make sure we understand that. If you were to throw your sponge and miss, since the game's continuing, and since you're going to get closer at every stage, 
basically, eventually you're going to lose, right? If you throw something and miss, then eventually the other player is going to wait until you're standing nose to nose and plonk the sponge on your head. All right? All right? So you basically, if you throw and miss, uh, you lose. All right? We need a few little uh, auxiliary rules here. Uh, so the auxiliary rules are uh, a step is you know, roughly a yard or something, and we need a rule that says that gentlemen never duck. All right? All right? So we're just going to throw and not, and not, and not try, and, try and duck. So uh, why don't we make, make uh, Willis uh, player one and Andrew player two. So Willis, you can go first. You can either choose to throw or to take a step forward. All right, Andrew? All right, now Willis, his turn again. And before he throws, we have some advice. Any advice? Who, thinks, who in the audience thinks he should throw at this point? Raise your hand if you think he should throw. Raise your hand if you think he should step. All right, large majority think you should step. Not much faith in your, in your throwing qualities, but. <laughs> All, right, well. All right, Andrew, let's have the poll again. Who thinks Andrew should throw now? Who thinks he should step? About 50-50, it's up to you. Did he hit or miss? I didn't leave, I'm too high up. Was it a glancing, was it a sufficient blow? Have a vote from the audience. Was that a hit or a, who thinks hit? Who thinks miss? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think you might have to continue forward. All right, so, so continue forward. And you can continue forward. And continue forward. And continue forward. All right, all right. All right, so good, good. Let me have my sponges back. Two more volunteers. We'll probably get, we'll manage to play this twice. We'll get to analyze it. Two more volunteers. Yeah, the, the boy in red and the girl here. Yeah? All right. So you both, you yeah, both are, it's, it's very wet. It's not very wet. I mean, well if, if, if it's too wet, I'm worried about getting sued. You know, so we keep, it, we keep it fairly light. So uh, let me get your names also. So your name is? Yeah. Zoe. And your name is? Owen. Owen. So Owen, Owen, come on to this side. Zoe on this side. Do I have parental permission for that? I guess I have parental permission for this. Okay. Okay, so Zoe, do you want to throw or step? Step. Step. All right. Owen? Zoe? What do people think? Should she throw or step? Yeah. Step. I think there's a lot of her step. <coughs> Owen? Oh, I think there was some ducking going on there. We'll award that one to Owen on the ground for this distinct ducking going on. All right, so can I get a round of applause for my volunteers here? Yeah? Right, in uh, where were my first volunteers, uh, Andrew and Willis, I, might, I may borrow you again. I may borrow you again to demonstrate a bit later on. So just, uh, but, but uh, stay there for now. All right, so we we're, we're going to. Analyze this game. We're going to try and see uh, how you, how people might play this game. Uh, what are the strategies involved? We're going to do a little better than that, and we're going to use only very minimal amounts of math. But when I'm using the math, I'll sort of wave my hands hands around and uh, warn you we're using some math, but not much. Uh, but before we do, why would we be interested in uh, a game like this? Well, um, I guess one reason is because it's kind of a famous game, right? So duels themselves, not many people fight duels today, but there were duels being fought, uh, certainly in Russia in the 19th century and various other periods of time, uh, with diff different rules, a little bit like this. Those of you who have, uh, you know, those of you who are in high school already, uh, not all of you, but some of those of you in high school already might be might be assigned at some point to read War and Peace, which is this enormous Russian novel. It's about this this fat, and somewhere about the middle of that novel, on about page 608 or something out of 1,200 and whatever, there's a, there's a duel between the main character and the, and the other character. And the main character in that duel, uh, I think uh, they're playing not with sponges, but with muskets, with guns. And I think the message we're meant to get from the novel is that the main character, the hero, actually shoots his gun too early. He more or less falls and, and you know, he nervously shoots his gun too early, but he survives. He said, oh, I just gave away the ending, but he does survive. He does survive. So there are duels. That's one reason we might be interested in this. But there are other games that have uh, things that look a little bit like this. So how many of you have watched the Tour de France on TV, the, the bike race on TV? A number of you, yeah? 
Uh, all right, so in bike racing, there's lots of things going on. There's lots of uh, strategies going on. But one of the things that bike racers have to decide to do, particularly in a long road race like the Tour de France, is they have to decide when to try to break away from the pack. The pack is called the peloton. So the individual riders want to break away and get far enough away from the pack of riders so that they'll stay ahead and win. And a critical decision for them, particularly on the flatter stages of the race, is when to launch that breakaway. So it isn't like they're launching a sponge, they're launching a breakaway. And if they leave it too long and they don't launch their breakaway, either someone else will successfully break away or nobody will break away, in which case the people who are best at sprinting will win the race. So if you're not a sprinter, you're just a regular uh, cyclist in these races, the timing decision when you choose to, to launch your breakaway is a little bit like when to launch your sponge. Right? Too early, you get reeled in again. Too late, someone else uh, shoots first and wins, uh, or breaks away first and wins. Let me give you a more economic example, since I am, after all, paid to be an economics professor. Imagine there's two firms, and these two firms are working very hard uh, uh, in R&D, in research and development, and they're trying to produce a new product. Maybe it's a new thing to plug into your computer, a new app to plug into your phone. Uh, and or oh, maybe it's a new type of phone, right? So they're, bo they're both working away at this, at this product, and they're making this product better and better and better. But it's, imagine that we know that the marketplace, in the marketplace, there's really only going to be room for one product, right? So it can't be that both these products are going to survive in the marketplace. Only one of them is going to survive. So these companies face a choice. Uh, uh, they can launch early or they can launch late. If they launch their product too early, and it doesn't, they haven't kind of perfected, they haven't got all the bugs out of this out of this app yet, or this phone yet, then the product isn't going to work, and then you, the consumers, us, the consumers, are not going to trust this company again. All right? On the other hand, if they launch too late, the other company may have launched before them, successfully got their product into the market, got a foothold of people using that kind of phone, and then you'll be too late to get your product into the market. So in that, in that economic context, the issue isn't how to launch your sponge, it isn't a duel, it's how to launch your product. But the idea is the same. All right, so as economists, we're interested in this kind of game, but let's forget that now and just go back to the game, the game at hand. So I'm going to start the analysis. I'm going to be boring for a few seconds. I just need a tiny bit, you know, just because I, just for shorthand, I need to have a tiny bit of shorthand. So let me write one thing on the board uh, for shorthand, okay, just so we know what it is. I'm going to be interested, we're going to be interested in analyzing this game in the probability, the probability, the likelihood uh, with which our players, so Andrew and Willis, for example, we're going to be interested in the likelihood that they'll hit their opponent when they throw their sponge. Right? For, for sure, it, it, it's not a sure thing they're going to hit. Sometimes they miss. It's not a sure thing they're going to miss. Sometimes they hit. So we're interested in what's the probability that they hit their opponent if they launch the sponge. Let's just write down a uh, notation, essentially, what we're going to use for that, just so we can have one piece of notation. One, this will be the only math we're going to use. So I'm going to let P1 b the probability so this is fancy but it isn't really saying anything probability that player one so player one was two player one was willis probability that willis hits two if he shoots at d what's d d is the distance of where he is so if all this notation is representing all it's going to represent, and it's just going to be shorthand, it's the probability that Willis hits Andrew if he were to throw his sponge when their D steps apart. Okay, that's, 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 it, for, that's it for notation now. We're done with notation. So those of you who don't like math, that was the math, more or less. All right? All right, so uh, let's get an idea what this thing looks like. So I'm going to draw a picture. I'm going to use this picture a lot. And on here, on one, on, on, on one axis of this, I'm going to represent distance. So the further we are along here, the further apart are Willis and Andrew. And on the other axis, I'm going to rep put down the probability that Andrew and Willis hit if they actually were to throw the sponge. All right? So let's make sure we understand what's going on here. At this end of the, at this end of the picture, uh, uh, Willis and Andrew are, n are standing nose to nose. There's no distance between them at all. They look slightly ludicrous, right? They're, they're, literally, their noses are touching. And out here, they're a long way apart, right? They're right across the room, maybe even further. Right? And we're going to keep track in this picture 
of what's the probability that they would hit if they were to shoot. So if they, if they shot, in fact, we saw this happen, right? So this happened, I guess Willis did this to Andrew. Uh, when Willis shot at Andrew from distance zero, what was the probability that he was going to uh, what was the probability that he was going to hit Andrew? One, basically, right? He was just he was going to hit for sure. No way he's going to miss. And as if, if they were further apart, as we as we imagine them getting uh, running running time backwards and having them go further apart, what's the probability that Andrew hits Willis or Willis hits Andrew as they get further apart? What, what happens to that thing? It goes down. It lessens. It lessens. I don't exactly know how it lessens, but it lessens. So maybe it does this. So as we get further apart, there's less and less chance. So the way to read this is, if Andrew is this far away, this far away from Willis, right, with this represents the whole distance of the room, then there's a pretty low probability that he's going to hit Andrew. And if, uh, if uh, Willis is very close to Andrew, then there's a high probability he'll hit Andrew if he shoots. Yeah. Why do you think it's not a straight line? Oh, it, it, might, it might be a straight line. That's fine. It, in fact, it could be a wiggly line. It could be, uh, I've drawn it this way, but it doesn't, it, nothing, I'm, nothing I'm about to say depends. All, all I'm going to assume is it goes down. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, I think it's plausible it goes down, but you're absolutely right, it could wiggle. In fact, I'm not even going to assume that the two players have the same line. All right? So it could well be that one of these players is a better shot than the other player. Right? So, so for example, the picture might look uh, like this. It could be that this is player one's shooting ability, and this is player two's shooting ability. All right? So in this picture, let's make sure we understand what it says now, uh, uh, the way I've drawn it now for this example, I guess what, what which way around was it? Was, was one Willis and two Andrew? I've forgotten. So this was, this was Willis and this was Andrew. So the way I've drawn it here, the way I've drawn it here, I've drawn it as if, which player is the better shot according to this picture? Player one or player two? So, play, player two, right? Because at any distance, any distance they happen to shoot at, player two has a slightly higher probability of hitting. So the way I've drawn it, player two, which is, in this case was Andrew, is the better shot, and player one, who was Willis, was the worst shot. Right? So it, it, again, just going back to that question, life might not look like this. It could be these lines cross. That's fine, as long as they're down with like Now I'm going to make one assumption that we're going to need to make to make this kind of manageable today. We've only got half an hour or so. So here's the one assumption. I'm going to assume that Andrew and Willis know each other. I'm not sure they do, actually. Did you, know, did you guys know each other before? We'll pretend they knew. Yeah, did, you, did you guys know each other before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's pretend they knew each other before. Let's make it possible to, to analyze this quickly. We're going to assume that Andrew knows how good Willis is as a shot, and Willis knows how good Andrew is as a shot. All right? That's probably not true. Okay? But let's assume, just for the purpose of being able to analyze this a bit, that they know each other's abilities. We'll assume that they're known. Right. Everyone okay with this picture? I know, I know it's a graph, and graphs are not the first thing you see in school, but nevertheless, it's not a very complicated graph. It's just saying, as you get further away, the probability of you hitting where you just shoot at that distance goes down. All right, that's going to be our tool for analyzing this. Now, let's try and talk about it. All right, so here we are talking about it. So the obvious question to ask is, the, the, way, the way I've set things up here, I've got one player who's a pretty good shot, I guess that was Andrew, and one player who's a less good shot, that was Willis. And the obvious question to ask is, who do you think should shoot first? The better shot, the person who's better at shooting, or the person who's less good at shooting? So suppose there's a duel, and one person is a crack shot with a musket, and the other person has never had a duel before in their life. Who do you think is going to shoot first? Who do you think should shoot first? The person who's a good shot? Remember, they're getting closer together. Who do you think is going to shoot first, the, the good shot or the less good shot? That's the,
Uh, all right, so I'm, 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 I'm hearing two arguments in there, right? So, I think, but the two, I guess, well, I mean, actually, that was both the arguments I'm looking for. Uh, and, and actually, there are, I think it's important to see that there are two arguments. a good answer, because there really are two ar arguments. Let me, let me try and summarize those two arguments to make it roughly right. So one of those arguments says, it's the better shot who should shoot first, because after all, he's got a better shot of hitting, better chance of hitting. So at any given distance, he's more tempted to shoot because he's got a higher chance of hitting. Right? And the contrary argument says, and I think uh, Zoe gave us this argument as well, actually, uh, uh, is that the less good shot might shoot first. Why might the less good shot shoot first? Well, I think it's exactly what Zoe said. The less good shot is worried about the better shot shooting him or her. All right? All right? So the good shot is, has a temptation. You might think the good shot shoots first because they've got a better chance of hitting, or you might think the worse shot wants to shoot first to preempt the better shot from shooting him or her. But now you can go further. You might say, well, in that case, maybe the good shot should shoot even earlier to preempt the bad shot from shooting earlier than him to, uh, uh, and, and shooting before him. Or maybe the bad shot should preempt the good shot from preempting the bad shot from trying to end so on and so forth, right? <laughs> so I think it's reasonable to conclude from this that it's not obvious. It's not at all obvious, actually, who should shoot first, the good shot or the, or the worst shot. You can come up with stories on both sides. All right, so at the level of an answer you would need as a politician or as a, you know, somebody on the, on the news, you could construct either argument. But from the point of view of coming up with an answer that will stand muster in a, in a science classroom, we want the right answer, not the politician's answer. So we, we have to do better than that. All right? So, so uh, it's complicated. It's going to be complicated. However, despite the fact that it's complicated, we are going to solve this. We're going to figure out exactly what's going to happen. All right? And when I say we, I mean we. All right, so we are, as a group, going to walk this through and figure out what's going to happen. And the argument's going to take us a bit of time, but so bear with me. And if you're not following the argument, wave your hands in the air. But we're going to go through step by step, and we're going to see, uh, we're going to see exactly who shoots, and we're going to do better than that. We're going to find out exactly when they shoot. All right, we're going to do better than that, better than you uh, might think. Now, on the way, I want to introduce two ideas, and I'll. I'll make a point of stopping and saying, this is one of the two ideas I want you to take away from this. Okay? So on the way, as we go through this discussion of who should shoot first and when, uh, we're going to come across two larger ideas that extend beyond this particular game of duel uh, to a more, uh, a more general setting, as you might find yourself. All right. So uh, I want to start, I'm going to use the board, I'm going to use the screen a second, with a question. So one way in which we analyze things in economics, but in many other subjects too, is we take this kind of large question, what's going to happen in this setting, and we try to break it down into smaller questions that we think we can handle. All right, so here's our first smaller question. It says, assuming that nobody has yet thrown their sponge, so both players still have their sponge, so both uh, uh, Andrew and, I'm sorry, Andrew and Willis, both Andrew and Willis still have their sponges, and suppose it's I's turn. So let's suppose I is Willis. Right? I, it's Willis's turn. And he's at distance D from Andrew. Right? And suppose that for whatever reason, Willis knows, right? suppose for whatever reason, Willis knows that tomorrow, next turn, when it's Andrew's turn, Andrew will not shoot. Right? So don't, 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 don't worry for now for why Willis knows this, but suppose Willis were to know that Andrew is not going to shoot when it's, when it's Andrew's turn, which I'll call tomorrow. All right? And notice, tomorrow they'll be a bit closer. They'll be at D minus 1. All right? If Willis knows that Andrew is not going to shoot when it's Andrew's turn tomorrow, what should Willis do today? What should Willis do today? Take a step. Take a step. Why? Exactly. And in fact, in fact, in fact not only does it add no risk, but in fact, Willis knows that tomorrow, actually the day after tomorrow, Willis will have another chance to shoot, and he's got a higher chance of hitting. All right? So, so it, it is, this is a fairly easy question to answer, because if Willis knows that Andrew's not going to shoot tomorrow, Willis will know that he'll have a better shot the day after tomorrow, and he should just wait for that. Everyone okay with that? Yeah? Yeah? So, shoot. Do, do not shoot. Sorry, step. Step. All right, that's the easy one. Now let's do a slightly harder one. Suppose that, once again, it's Willis's turn. Nobody has shot the sponge yet. 
Uh, and suppose this time that Willis knows, for whatever reason, Willis knows that Andrew will shoot tomorrow. Right? So Willis just knows, for whatever reason, Willis knows that tomorrow Andrew's going to shoot. Andrew's going to be at D minus 1, Willis is at D. Now what should Willis do? Yeah, that's Andrew. Higher chance of hitting. All right, all right. So what? So one argument says shoot now because otherwise the guy's going to shoot me tomorrow. All right, shoot now because otherwise the guy's going to shoot me tomorrow. What? Somebody give me. Somebody give me. That's a good argument. Somebody, somebody give me a counter argument. Let's try. Yep. Someone else give a counter argument. Uh, yes. It depends on the distance. Depends on the distance. All right. Depends on the distance. So why? What's what's the counter argument? So we had an argument why you should shoot now. To shoot now to prevent himself getting shot tomorrow when they'll be closer. Why might you not shoot now? So so it could be, for example, for example, if we're still pretty far apart, and I know I'm Willis, I know that Andrew's going to shoot tomorrow, I might not care about that very much because I think Andrew's going to miss tomorrow. Is that right? Is that right? So, it, so what's the answer to this? I think we're, we're sort of putting together those arguments go in either direction. And as uh, Owen, as Owen said, it depends. So the answer is it depends, and it clearly depends on the distance. But we can be a bit more specific than that. A bit specific than that. So let's just let's just take a step back from not not literally a step back, but let's think about what it depends on. So I need to compare two things. I need to compare the probability of my coming out of this alive, my staying alive, by throwing now and hitting the other guy. That's one thing I can do. All right? And I need to compare that with the probability that I stay alive by waiting, taking a step, and having the other guy miss tomorrow. Is that right? So, so the, the two ways I can win this game, I know the, guy, the other guy is going to shoot tomorrow if I don't shoot today. So basically, there's two ways I can win. I can win by shooting and hitting, so I worry about the probability of that happening. All right? Or I can step, in which case I win with the probability that the other guy does what? The other guy misses. misses. All right, so I need to compare the probability of my hitting today with the probability of the other guy missing tomorrow. All right, the left-hand side is the probability that I win if I shoot, and the right-hand side is the probability that I win if I wait, because the other guy is going to shoot, in which case I need him to miss. Right? Is everyone okay with the greater than or equal sign here? It's, 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 a, it's a greater than or equal sign. Right? It, it, it could be a greater than sign. I don't really mind about the equal. All right? So I should shoot if I think I've got a better chance of winning by hitting him today than I have by, from hoping that he misses tomorrow. All right, now I'm going to use my notation. All right, so here's my use of math. I promise that the only math I'm about to use is arithmetic. And I know that, okay, it's just arithmetic. So I don't know what grade it is, but it's just arithmetic. Algebra, I guess. Same thing. All right. So what's the probability that I hit today in our notation? That's the probability that I hit if I shoot at distance d. That's what we call PID. PID is just the name we've given to the probability that I hit today if I shoot today. The probability that J misses tomorrow is something a bit more complicated, but it's not that complicated. It's the probability that J hits me tomorrow is just pj d minus 1. It's d minus 1 because they're closer together now. All right? And so that, that, that's the probability that j hits me tomorrow. The probability that he misses is 1 minus that. All right? All right okay. that's, that's, that's about as hard as the math's going to get, so let's just make sure everyone's OK with that. The probability that I hit tomorrow, we, we know what that is. That's just PID, as we called it. The probability that j hits, hits tomorrow is pj d minus 1, and 1 minus that must be the probability that J misses. All right. So now my, uh, you know, hold on to your seats for my one piece of algebra. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna do my one bit of algebra. I'm gonna take this pj d minus one. I'm gonna add it to both sides. I'm gonna add it to both sides. That was my algebra. Okay. All right. So if, if, if the algebra was was uh, uh, too fast, don't worry about it. The argument is what matters. The argument is in this line. That's what we care about. And here's the conclusion. The conclusion is, I should shoot if I think the probability of my hitting today 
plus the probability that you hit tomorrow is bigger than one. Kind of a neat thing. Okay, everyone okay with that? Let's run past it again. So here we just had the probability that I hit today versus the probability that you miss tomorrow. I took this pj d minus one and I swung it over the other side of the edit bars. That's it for math. Okay, everyone okay with it? Uh, 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 wave your hands in the air if that was horrific math. Are we okay? The parents are the ones who should be embarrassed here. Are the, uh, are, are the parents okay with the math? Yes, yes, okay, okay, okay. So this, this is what I'm going to use. This is what I'm going to use. All right. Okay, let's go back to the picture to see if we understand this a little bit. So here's our picture. It shows the probability of, of uh, our two players, uh, uh, um, uh, Willis and Andrew, which shows the probability of that they hit at different distances. And you can see that if we were to sum these probabilities together, let's put the steps in here. Let's put some step sizes in here. So here they are stepping. We can see that at the beginning of the game, when they're very far apart, all right, the probability that I hit plus the probability that the other guy hits, probably that Andrew hits plus the probability that Jay hits tomorrow, is small. And in particular, doesn't add up to one. Here's one. All right? So over here, the probability that Andrew hits plus the probability that, that uh, uh, um, Willis hits tomorrow is small. It's less than one. But over here, the probability that Andrew hits plus the probability that Willis hits tomorrow is big. It's bigger than one. Right? right? So here it's small, and here it's big. All right? And somewhere in between, somewhere in between, it's going to have to cross one. The sum of those two lines is going to have to cross one. And it's fine where that is, roughly speaking. So I'm going to guess it. I think it's about, it may be about uh, here, say. All right? So let me call this distance d star. Right? Now, what have we just done? We've argued that when Willis and Andrew are far away from each other, the sum of the probabilities that they hit, or more formally, the sum of the probability one of them hits today and the other one hits tomorrow, the sum is less than one. And that's a realm of, that's part of the world where they shouldn't shoot even if they know the other guy is shooting tomorrow. But in here, the sum of the probabilities, the sum of the probability that I hit today plus the probability that you hit tomorrow is bigger than one. So in here, if I think you're going to shoot tomorrow, I should shoot today. And this D star, all it is, all it is, is it's the first time, it's the first time we cross the barrier whereby those probabilities add up to more than one. All right? Let's get, let's, let's, let's visualize this better by seeing them. Can, can I borrow Andrew and Willis again? All right. So, uh, just to make sure we understand what we're, what we're talking about in physical terms rather than math terms. Let's bring out our people again. Here they are with their sponges. I've forgotten which color was which, but let's, let's not worry about that. All right. And initially, if we put them, we, I'm going to use those mannequins now. So you, if you initially, when they're, when they're way back, go way back, way back, way back, way back at the beginning of the game, way back at the beginning of the game, we're out here somewhere. Here we are out here. We're out here, and there's a very low chance of them hitting. They're going to miss. And even if you added both probabilities together, you, you know, it's still less than one. They're still going to miss. All right? So out here, not much chance of them hitting. Let's bring them in a lot. So we can bring them in, 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 so about here. So now there's a pretty high probability they're going to hit. Each, each, I'm going to go back a bit, back a bit, back a bit. Even here, the probability they're going to hit is probably for each of them bigger than a half, so the sum is going to be bigger than one. All right? So now we're in this kind of close region. We're in this close region where the sum is bigger than one. Right? And there's some critical distance. I don't know what it is. Let's pretend it's, take another step back, perhaps. Take one more step back. My guess is about here, say. So at this distance here, if we summed the probability that Willis hits today if he shoots, plus the probability that Andrew hits tomorrow, which will be one step closer, so take one step closer, that will equal one. All right? So there's some critical distance. That's my critical distance. Now, why am I bothering you with this critical distance? What are we wasting time on this one about? Here's why I'm wasting time. Because here's what we're going to show. We're going to show, stay here for a bit, because we'll, we'll help, you can help us with it. We're going to show that nobody should shoot here, 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 or here. But whoever's turn this is, 
Well, this turn this is, they should shoot. Right? We're going to show that no shot, no shot, no shot, don't shoot, don't shoot, step, 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 shoot. All right, we're going to show that whoever's turn it happens to be at that critical D star, that person should throw their sponge. All right, that's what we're going to try and show. All right, does everyone understand at least what it is we're trying to show? I mean, we haven't shown it yet, but everyone understands what we're trying to show. We're trying to show that the way to play this game, the way to survive this game, the best chance of surviving this game, is whoever you are, once you get to D star, shoot. All right, now we're going to provide the argument why that's true. The first thing I want to argue is that you shouldn't shoot far away. That's the easy part, but we'll do it anyway. So let's go back to the beginning. Here we are back at the beginning. And here's Andrew and Willis. And Willis was player one, right? Yeah. So here's Willis, and he's thinking, he's player one, and we saw him thinking, right? we saw him in real time. This is the low-tech equivalent of an action replay, right? We're doing action replay uh, by actually bringing the people out here, right? So in the low-tech equivalent of action replay, here we are in slow motion now. He's thinking through, should he shoot, right? And what's he thinking about? Well, for example, he's thinking about his probability of hitting, he's thinking about the other guy's probability of hitting, and he's thinking about two things. One thing he might think about is, is the following thought. He might say, suppose, suppose if I take a step now, suppose if I, Willis, take a step now, suppose Willis doesn't shoot tomorrow. Sorry, suppose Andrew does not shoot tomorrow. Right? So Willis might think, Willis might think, suppose I think that Andrew will not shoot tomorrow. So if Willis thinks that Andrew is not shooting tomorrow, which fact should we use? Should we use fact A or fact B? Fact A, right? And what does fact A tell us to do? Don't shoot. Tells us to, tells us to step. Is that right? So if, if Willis thinks Andrew's going to step tomorrow, then Willis should step today. All right? What about the contrary thought? What if Willis thinks that Andrew is going to shoot tomorrow? Right? If, suppose Willis thinks... You know, I know Andrew a little bit. I've seen him around town. He's going to shoot me tomorrow. All right? All right, so if Willis thinks that Andrew is going to shoot him tomorrow, then which fact should we use? We should B, and then we read off from fact B. And fact B says Willis should shoot today. If his, Willis's probability of hitting today is bigger than the probability that, uh, that Andrew misses tomorrow, and that boils down to does the sum of these two probabilities exceed one? Well, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Here's, here's the probability... That, uh, that Willis is going to hit today. Here's the probability that Andrew's going to hit tomorrow, if he shoots tomorrow. Does the sum of those two things get you up to there? Not even close, right? Not even close. So therefore, uh, if Willis thinks that Andrew is going to shoot tomorrow, Willis should not shoot. Summarize, right? If Willis thinks Andrew is not going to shoot tomorrow, then Willis should step and not shoot. If Willis thinks Andrew is going to shoot tomorrow, then Willis should step and not shoot. Therefore, what should Willis do? Not shoot, not shoot right? Right? That clear already? So whichever, whichever Willis thinks Andrew's going to do here, he gets the same answer, namely not shoot. All right? Not shoot in either case. All right? So this is a, this is a nice, simple case. No matter what Willis thinks Andrew's going to do, in either case, it's better for Willis to step, so Willis should step. Now let's go to Andrew. Right? So we're, we're, uh, a lot of analyzing games is about putting yourself in other people's shoes or putting yourself in other people's heads. But sometimes you have to come out of one person's head and into another person's head. So all of us, were in, we were all in, in Willis's head. Now we're going to come out of there, and we're all going to put ourselves in Andrew's head. Right? So here we are in Andrew's head, and Andrew can have two possible thoughts, many possible thoughts, but two th thoughts we care about here. One thought he might have is, I think Willis is going to try and shoot me tomorrow. Or, well, let's do the other one first. I think that Willis is not going to try and shoot me tomorrow. So I think, so Andrew might think, if he steps, if he, Andrew, steps, Willis will not shoot tomorrow. All right? That will allow us to use fact A. And so if it's the case that Andrew thinks that Willis is not going to shoot tomorrow, what should Andrew do? Step. Step. Good. Wait, 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 wait. Good, good, good. But, all right? but if, uh, what, what about if Andrew thinks that Willis is going to shoot him tomorrow? Then which fact should we use? B, and then we'll look at fact B, and B says shoot if the sum of the probabilities is bigger than one. Well, here's Andrew's probability. We already put it in there. And here's Willis's probability tomorrow, and this plus this is much less than one still, right? So again, Andrew should not shoot. So 
whether Andrew thinks that Willis is going to shoot tomorrow or if Andrew thinks Willis is not going to shoot tomorrow, in either case, he should not shoot. So he should take a step forward. All right, so take a step. All right, everyone okay with that? So here's a case where, here's another case where either way, the argument goes the same way. Yes, sir? Well, hold that thought. We'll come back. Um, I want to get to that at the end, exactly that thought. It turns out no, but, but, but hold the thought and I'll ask it in a, in a bit, because later on it is going to matter. But for now, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, good. So, but it's a good thought. All right, so, so far, we've argued that the first two steps, we don't shoot here and we don't shoot here. And notice that in either case, the argument was pretty simple. Because no matter whether you thought the other guy was going to shoot tomorrow or if you thought the other guy was not going to shoot tomorrow, in either case, you wanted to take a step. And there's a name for that kind of argument. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the name is. I'll tell you what it is, but it doesn't matter. The name of the argument is a dominance argument. It says in either circumstance, the in either circumstance, or either thought experiment, the answer is the same. So do that. So if, if we're in fact A, I shouldn't shoot. And if we're in fact B, I shouldn't shoot, then I shouldn't shoot. Right? Not, a hard, not a hard form of argument. Right? Hard, it says, Whatever's, whatever I think is going to happen, I shouldn't shoot. All right? So one of the sort of lessons, I said bigger, bigger ideas I wanted to come out of here. So dominance arguments are a good idea to keep in the back of the mind. There are some, there are some cases where you think a, 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 something's complicated, but when you analyze it, no matter how, how you analyze it, or whatever assumptions you make, you get the same answer, and then you should just take that answer. All right? So here's the easy case. I should not shoot here. And we could go on doing this and bring them closer and closer together. And we'll go on using the same, argu uh, uh, the same argument again and again until we get to here. So not shoot, not shoot, not shoot, not shoot. And we'll have concluded that all the way here, you should not shoot. And finally, We'll be at, we, we, we've done this argument several times over, and finally we'll be at D star, and I guess it's Andrew's turn. So let's put, us, put, our, put ourselves back at D star. Let's put, put, was that about D star? And now it's Andrew's turn, as the way I've drawn it. It's Andrew's turn. And Andrew is now thinking, and he goes through exactly the same thought experiment. Andrew says, if I think Willis is not going to shoot tomorrow, if I, Andrew, think that Willis is not going to shoot tomorrow, then what should I do, Andrew? What should I do? Step forward. Step forward. But now, if Andrew thinks that Willis is going to shoot tomorrow, now if he thinks Willis is going to shoot tomorrow, now when he compares his probability of hitting today with, Willis, uh, with Willis's probability of, of missing tomorrow, if you like, when he looks at the sum of these two probabilities, which is this probability for Andrew and this probability for, uh, uh, for Willis, now for the first time, that sum is bigger than one. That sum's bigger than one. All right, so now our dominance argument's going to break down because now, for the first time, if Andrew thinks Willis is not shooting, then Andrew should step forward. But if now, if, but if a Andrew thinks that Willis is shooting, now Andrew should, should shoot. Everyone see that? Everyone see that? All right, so at this distance d star, we have a dilemma. For the first time, we have a genuine dilemma. Right? If Andrew thinks Willis is going to shoot, he should shoot. If, Alice, if Andrew thinks Willis is going to not shoot, he should not shoot. And the problem is, we don't know what Andrew's going to do. So we need another trick. We need another trick. And here's our trick. And our trick is going to be the second big lesson of today. When you, don't, when you can't immediately see what people are going to do and you want to figure it out, a good way to get there, a good way to figure it out, is to work not from the front of the game moving forwards, which is starting them at the end of the room and having them walk towards each other. Don't run time forwards. Start at the end of the game and work backwards. All right, so if I could get my kids, who are eight and six, to do this, I would be very happy. See where things are going and work backwards. All right, all right. So that's what we're going to do. So the end of the game is when? Well, the end of the game is when they're really close. Let's bring them in, bring them in, bring them in, 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 keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Embarrassingly close for high school kids. Keep going, keep going. Closer, 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 closer. All right, all right, all right. As close as high school kids can bear to be, right? Right? All right, so that's the end of the game, right? At that stage, there's zero distance apart, right? They're at distance zero, right? I'm not saying we ever get to this stage, but if we did, they would be at distance zero. All right, so this was two, one, 
2121221. Turns out the way I've drawn it here, this is Willis's turn. Right, this would turn out to be Willis's turn. If it turns out that Andrew and Willis find themselves at this embarrassingly close nose-touching distance for high school kids, and they both still have their sponges, and they're both still trying to survive the game, not just the embarrassment of the game, but the game itself, all right, what should Willis do at this point? He should shoot, right? He should shoot. What? He could, well, yeah, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But, he's, but wait, does everyone agree that, that Willis should shoot at this point? Why should Willis shoot at this point? Because he's going to hit. He's going to hit, right? He's going to hit with probability one. He's going to hit with probability one. So for sure, if we get to this stage in the game, which we sure as we're not going to get to the stage in the game, but if we were to get to the stage in the game, for sure, Willis should shoot. So we know that if we get to this step, Willis shoots. Now we're going to run time backwards. So time backwards, that was Willis's turn. So the previous turn must have been Andrew. So it must have been Andrew who took the last step. So Andrew, take one step backwards. Okay. Not such a big step. There you go. Okay. So here we are. Here's a step before they got nose to nose. They're not such an embarrassing distance anymore. All right. Here's Andrew and Willis. They've both got their sponges. They're one step apart. Okay. And it's Andrew's turn. Since the next turn's Willis's turn, this must be Andrew's turn. Is that right? Now here's the key. What does Andrew now know? What does Andrew know is going to happen tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. Right. So, take a thing. Exactly. So now, previously it was a hypothetical, but now we know it. We kn Andrew now knows. Andrew knows that if he doesn't shoot now, Willis will shoot tomorrow. Is that correct? We just argued that. So which fact should Andrew be using to analyze what he should do? He should use B. He should use fact B because he knows. He knows that Willis is going to shoot tomorrow. Here we are at distance one. It's Andrew's turn. He knows Willis is going to shoot tomorrow. So he should be adding up this probability and that probability. And the sum of those two probabilities is bigger than one or smaller than one? Much bigger than one. It's one plus something, which is definitely bigger than one, right? So it's, it's, it's much bigger than one. So, so therefore, just following our rule, what should Andrew do at distance one? Shoot. All right, so Andrew will shoot if we get to that stage. Let's go back one more step. All right, so the previous go must have been Willis's turn. So Willis, uh, take a step back. Here we are in Willis's shoes at distance equals two. Although I haven't been writing it here, but I could. So at distance one, we had Willis shoot, and at distance, sorry, distance zero, and this was Andrew, and he shot. And here we are at distance two, and it's Willis's turn. And what does Willis know now? Here we are at distance, we've run the clock backwards, but Willis can do that. What does Willis know is going to happen if he doesn't shoot and we get to distance one? What does he know? He knows Andrew's going to shoot. So which fact should he be using? He's using fact B, and fact B says, I should shoot if the sum of these probabilities are bigger than one, and we're talking about this probability and this probability, and those two lines are much bigger than one. So again, he should shoot. All right? And then we go back again, and we do... This, then it'll be, uh, we go back another step, so take another step back, and then it'll be Andrew's turn, and here we are at distance three, and once again, the same analysis will tell us to shoot, and here we are at D star minus one, and it's Willis's turn, and Willis, once again, will know that Andrew's going to shoot tomorrow, so he should shoot if this distance plus this distance are bigger than one, and this distance plus this distance are bigger than one, so once again, uh, uh, Willis should shoot, and now we're back to D star. Okay, so I, I just ran it. I ran the clock backwards, and we're back where we cared about at D star. So go back to D star, and it's Willis's turn. It's sorry, it's Andrew's turn, isn't it? Right. And what do we say about D star? We said Andrew should not shoot at D star if Andrew thinks that Willis is not going to shoot tomorrow. And we said that Andrew should shoot at D star if Andrew thinks that Willis is going to shoot tomorrow. But what does Andrew now know? By us running the clock backwards. What does Andrew know? Andrew knows that Willis is going to shoot at D star minus one. He is going to shoot tomorrow. Andrew knows that Willis will shoot him tomorrow, so Andrew should shoot today. So what have we shown? We showed more than I claimed I'd show, actually. We've shown, hang on a second, hang on. We've shown that nobody should shoot till D star. Whoever's turn it was, it turned out to be Andrew, should shoot at D star. And by the way, we've also shown something else. We've shown that if Andrew doesn't shoot at D star, then Willis should shoot at D star minus one. 
et cetera, et cetera. We showed more than we claim we're going to show. All right? All right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Let me get these right. thank, thank you again for my, for my volunteers. Now, let's try and just uh, take a step back on what we've just shown. So, I have time. We asked the question going in, we said, who should shoot first in this game? The good shot or the bad shot? The better shot or the worse shot? And we had some answers. So Zoe gave us an answer, and it turned out to be complicated. It was a hard thing. And what we've learned is that actually, in some ways, that's the wrong question. The question is, when should somebody shoot? And it turns out that what matters is the critical distance, and whoever happens to be the, sh the turn at that critical distance, in this case, Andrew, should shoot. Right. Andrew, I think the way we'd written things up was the, uh, was the worst shot. No, it was the better shot. And so it turned out that Andrew shot first. But that was just because it just happened to be Andrew's turn at D star. All right. You've heard this, or some of you have heard this before in movies, right? Uh, in movies, they tell you, uh, they tell the, the soldiers, uh, what do they tell them? They tell them, shoot when you can see the whites of their eyes. Who's, who's heard that expression? Yeah? They don't say, if you're a good shot, shoot at distance 10 yards. If you're a bad shot, shoot at distance 15 yards. They say, shoot if you, at, at, when you can see the whites of their eyes. There's a set distance at which they tell you to shoot. All right? So what we've learned here is we can solve this thing. How do we solve it? We broke it into smaller parts. We took this relatively large game. We broke it into little games and little arguments. Every step was its own decision. right? And we analyzed each decision in turn. And on the way, we saw two tricks. And let me just remind you what the tricks were, but we're not done. Trick one was, if you have two arguments and both arguments go in the same direction, then that's easy. That's a dominance argument. Right? If, 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 you're in a, if, if you're in a case where you say, if it's case A, I should shoot, sorry, if it's, if it's case A, I should not shoot, and if it's case B, I should not shoot, then you should not shoot. And the second argument that we saw was when you get stuck, and maybe even before you get stuck, it's often useful to go from the back of the game and work backwards. That turns out to be easier than analyzing things from the front. All right? It's easy to go at the back of the game, see where we're going to end up, and work backwards rather than try and work it out all from the front. All right. Now, somebody asked a very good question in the middle. I promise I'll come back to it. The gentleman over here, he said, well, what if said, you're kind of assuming that other people are, are both capable of and are doing this analysis. Right? So, so other people are sort of doing the same analysis with you. Right? So that's a great question. So let's answer that question. So I've shown you how you should play this game, how you should survive if you're playing this game among people who live in New Haven and have the benefit of going to lectures at Yale. But suppose you had the misfortune to live in Cambridge, Mass, and so you go to lectures at Harvard, and it's all muddled, right? All right. So, or oh, more point, suppose you are you, you, you live in New Haven, so you get the good lectures at Yale, but you're playing a game against somebody from Cambridge, Mass, who's had the muddled lectures at Harvard. So they're going to get this thing wrong, or they might get this thing wrong. Now what should I do? What part of this argument survives the idea that the other guy playing, or the other girl playing, may not be as learned and sophisticated as you guys are? All right. Well, I want to argue, what about this part? What about the argument that you should not shoot in this, in this stage? That survives. Why does that survive? Good. Why does that survive? Exactly. Exactly. Because it was a dominance argument. There was an argument that said, whatever they're going to do, I should do this. It doesn't really matter what they are. It doesn't matter if they're a Harvard-trained economist or a, a, a chimpanzee or a robot or, or a bollard. Whatever, you know, anything. It doesn't matter, it, it doesn't matter what I'm playing. This, this was just, whatever the other guy is going to do, I shouldn't shoot. Right? So I shouldn't shoot. Right? That part of the argument survives. But what about when we get in here? Here, once we were getting here, I was starting to do arguments of the form. Here I was, I, I was in Andrew's, it was Andrew? Yeah, I was in Andrew's shoes here. And here we said, here I am being Andrew, and Andrew knows that uh, that, uh, uh, sorry, w w Willis? Andrew knows that Willis is going to shoot tomorrow, and the reason An Andrew knows that Willis is going to shoot tomorrow is because Willis knows that Andrew's going to shoot the day after that, and, and Andrew knows that Willis knows that because Willis knows that Andrew knows that Willis is going to shoot the shot after that. And that involved a lot of, kind of interactive reasoning, so there we have problems. Yes? Um, well, you need to know the, the curve. You need to know your curve. Mm -hmm. well, that'd be practical. Mm. 
Good. So I've uh, uh, absolutely right. So I've assumed throughout that you know these curves, and I'm going to have to ask you, given we don't have much time, to take it on faith, but I haven't shown you this, that if you don't know these people's curves and you had some distribution over those curves, that roughly the same analysis goes through. But you're absolutely right. That was an assumption I made to make the analysis simple. Right? That's, a, that's a different kind of argument. So you're absolutely right. I made a sort of assumption about the physics of the world, that I know people know this curve, these curves are given, whereas the assumption we're talking about now is assumption about people's ability to reason. What, what, what I think we've argued is that if I think the other person isn't capable of doing the reasoning, I certainly should not shoot early. I shouldn't shoot before D star, but maybe, maybe I might be prepared to shoot a little bit later in the hope that they might make an error and shoot late. Is that right? Is that right? So even if I am not confident in the other person's ability to reason, not their ability to shoot, their ability to reason, I still shouldn't shoot before I see the whites of their eyes. All right, so here's an interesting fact. I've played this game over the years with business school classes over the years uh, up at SOM, the School of Management, and with uh, parents and with prospective students and with lots and lots and lots of undergraduates. And in the vast majority of cases, the vast majority of cases, people miss. All right? So I take my whole sample of people playing this game. Uh, 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 people occasionally hit. It isn't that they never hit. But in the vast majority of cases, people miss. All right? And you might think that on average, since it's kind of random whether I get the good shot or the bad shot, and it's on average, it's random who ha happens to be shooting at D star, and the two probabilities at D star, roughly speaking, add up to one, you might think that on average, if people are playing the way I'm saying, on average, they should hit half the time over a large sample. But I don't. I see them missing all the time. We saw that today. They miss. All right? Why? Why do people miss in this case? What's going on? What's, why do so many people miss? Yeah. They shoot before the D star. Why do they shoot before? They, they, why do they? Why are they all shooting so early before D star? Yeah, I think one thing that's going on is overconfidence. People are overconfident in their ability to throw a sponge. Throwing a sponge is like throwing a wiffle ball. It's really hard. So a lot of people. Uh, you know, they think they're really great at throwing a sponge. They just, they just overestimate their abilities. But maybe they even overestimate their opponent's abilities too. I think that's what, half of what's going on. I think there's another thing going on, and I think it's specific to America. I, as you probably can tell, didn't start life in America. So here's the other thing I think is going on. I think there's an, a bias that people are trained in America, in school, by your parents, by your teachers, and it's a bias in favor of doing things. Right? You're often told, be proactive. How many of you have been told by your parents or teachers, be proactive? Do something. Right? And this is terrible advice. Sorry, parents. This is terrible <laughs> advice. All right? uh, being proactive is a good thing sometimes. It's a bad thing at other times. This is a bias that Americans have. So uh, what's my evidence for this bias other than the sponge game? How many of you watch Sports Center in the evening on ESPN? Sometimes, right? So you, you, you're watching some basketball game. It gets to the end, and they're interviewing this basketball player in the locker room. And the basketball player says, the great thing about this game, the great thing about where we are now, is uh, we control our own destiny. And for me, as an English person, controlling my own destiny sounds like a bad thing, <laughs> kind of scary. You know, if I'd wanted to control my own destiny, I certainly wouldn't have got married. Right? <laughs> so I think there's a problem here. There's a tendency for people to shoot too early, partly because they're overconfident in their abilities, and partly because they're sort of trained that you, it's better to shoot and lose than it is just to lose. So if the takeaway lesson for surviving is this, is this. The point, the point is not to go down swinging. The point is not to go down. <laughs> we'll leave it there. I'm done.